The content available on this podcast and on lauriewilliamsseniorservices.com has been produced for educational purposes only. The contents of any episodes do not constitute medical, legal, or professional advice, do not reflect the opinions of this company, any of its parent companies or affiliates, and do not create any type of professional relationship between the audience, guest, and the host. No person listening to this podcast should act or refrain from acting on the basis of the content of a podcast without first seeking appropriate professional advice and or counseling, nor shall the information be used as a substitute for professional advice and or counseling. Lori Williams Senior Services, LLC, expressly denies any and all liability relating to any actions taken or not taken based on any or all contents of this podcast. Welcome to Aging in Style with me, Lori Williams. I'm an optimist by nature, and I believe you can follow your dreams at any age. My grandmother's journey with dementia ignited a passion in me to work with seniors. I've spent the past 13 years learning about seniors and aging. In my mid-50s, I followed my own dream and founded my company, where I use my expertise to help seniors locate housing and resources. On this podcast, we cover all aspects of aging. Join us each week to meet senior living experts and inspirational seniors who are following their dreams. The fact is, we're all aging, so why not do it in style? Hey guys, welcome to the show. Today we are talking about a topic that comes up frequently uh, when I speak with families and it's about estate planning and having that conversation. And so often when I talk to um, usually the families of seniors, they have no idea what their parents' wishes are, what their income is. And unfortunately, it's usually in a 911 situation where maybe dad has had a stroke. He cannot verbalize, tell, tell us what his plans are. And we, we really don't know, um, you know, financially or, or what his wishes are. So that's why it is so, so important to have that conversation. And we're going to give you some tips today. Today we have, um, Lauren Book with us. And he is the founding attorney of Book Law Firm, located in Carrollton, Texas. And he specializes in estate planning and probate matters involving retirees and their families. And he's about to launch a new practice in elder care law, which is a holistic approach to life care planning. And uh, we were connected a couple of weeks ago and had a great conversation. And I think he is an amazing resource and want to um, meet with him and to have him share his knowledge with us. So we're going to get started and welcome Lauren. Thanks, Lori. How are you? It's so great to be with you. Good. I'm so, I'm great. I'm glad that you are um, you know, available to do the podcast today. And I think this is such an important topic. Um, so to get started, why don't you tell us um, what led you into working with the state planning and with seniors? Sure. So my grandparents were very influential figures uh, in my life. I was raised by a wonderful single mom and her mom and dad were, you know, they were like a second set of parents to me. And like many families, we watched them go through the aging process, uh, both the highs and the lows. And there's a motivation there when you have spent uh, a lot of time being someone's grandchild uh, to continue in that care position. And many of us get to discharge it in different ways. Uh, I went to law school. And so the practice of law was was a medium that I could kind of take my place in the senior care community. And so that's what I do. And you're exactly right. We have an office in Carrollton uh, where we serve seniors and their families with their estate planning needs. And it is, it's, it's sort of a professional continuation of something that a lot of us have been doing for a long time. Mm-hmm. So, and we love it. That's great. And we were speaking earlier and it's, it's always interesting to me on all these podcasts, how many people their driving force was the influence was their grandparents. Mm-hmm. So it happens with so many of us. Yep. The big question is, you know, like we were talking about people don't like to have this conversation. So why is it <laughs> that people avoid having the conversation? Well, these things are not light topics. Mm-hmm. Obviously death is a weird thing to talk about openly with people, whether it's your family. I mean, it's a weird thing to talk about with your attorney uh, to begin with, but it's a very important thing. Mm -hmm. It's important that your family members know not only the kind of the hard side, right? Your, your business side of your finances and your wishes and all of that. There's a soft side of this as well, that your family needs to know 
how much you love and care about them. Your mm-hmm. family needs to know, you know, in, in situations maybe where there have been hard times in the past that, you know, forgiveness is available or people need to seek reconciliation with family members. Just getting it out there and being communicative. Mm-hmm. It's hard for us as humans to begin with. It can get really hard when we're talking about, you know, end of life matters. I was very fortunate. Um, my grandfather, who was much like the father figure in my life, uh, he drove a 1997 white Ford Ranger when I was in high school and he would putter around town, running errands, mowing yard, doing whatever. And I was with him, you know, most of the time. And it was in the cab of that 97 Ranger where he would introduce me to the idea that he would no longer, you know, one day mm-hmm. he wouldn't be here. And I'm a mid to late teenager. It put me in the position to start thinking about, hey, there's going to come a point where I'm going to transition from a teenager to a young adult and then ultimately to a man. And it set the stage for for a way of thinking about this topic that didn't necessarily, it wasn't pleasant, but Mm -hmm. it didn't make it scary. Mm -hmm. And I think in some ways when he ultimately did pass in 2012, it made the grief process Easier might be the wrong word. Mm -hmm. The shock value, I think, maybe was lessened uh, because I I could draw back on those experiences of having that talk with him about where he wanted certain things to go and how he wanted certain things to be. And just preparing me to kind of step into my just in my small family to kind of step into the role as kind of the father figure. Um, It was it was difficult to hear at times, Mm -hmm. but it's been very necessary. And I think sharing that experience with clients uh, helps them kind of navigate some of these pitfalls. You don't know what you don't know. Exactly. You know, and if you have uh, if you have a surviving spouse or if you have adult kids that you expect someday to take the reins, then you have to bring them in the loop. And and having this conversation is a way to do that. And you're right. It's not always comfortable. But if you don't tell your family what it is that you want, then you know, how will they ever know? Yeah, I agree. And I mean, I think a lot of people sort of live in denial. Um, You know, they don't want to talk about those things. They don't want to talk about dying. But I mean, it's really, it's, um, it's something, I think a gift that you give to your family, because I've seen so many people who you're not only grieving the passing, and maybe it's, you know, even a younger person, but now you've got to figure out, you know, I don't know what their finances were. I don't know what their wishes were. Did they want to be cremated? Do they want to be buried? I mean, those are really hard decisions that families already in the midst of a crisis. Now they have to try to determine what would their loved one have wanted and how are we taking care of mom now? With yeah. You know, she knew nothing about finances. We call it the fog of grief, mm-hmm. that when you're in a grieving state, you are not in the right frame of mind to be having to make business decisions for the first time. Mm -hmm. And so being able to have an upfront conversation before it becomes an issue can really, one, it's, it's, we have to respect that fog. That Mm -hmm. is a natural part of the grieving process that you just don't see things clearly when you're in the middle of this emotional chaos in your life, particularly if it's the case of a surviving spouse. Mm -hmm. I just think about, I think about my own marriage. I'll be married 10 years next March. And my hope is that my wife and I have a long journey together. But if we do, at some point, one of us is going to pass on and it's going to be like losing a piece of yourself. Mm -hmm. And who's going to be in the right emotional state to be making financial decisions, to be making burial decisions, to be knowing where the where the contact list is Mm -hmm. for the professionals to be to have to rifle through, you know, disheveled papers or or any of those things for the first time in that emotional state, I think it makes the grieving process a lot harder. I would agree. And I I think that's probably, you know, it gets to the next question is, you know, why is it so critical to have this conversation? And we've already kind of touched on that, but what other, um, you know, what other things do you see? So one of the things is very practical and we see this in, in families, particularly maybe where we are transitioning uh, some decision-making authority to our older kids. Mm -hmm. Uh, having this conversation helps you find the doer. It helps you find the person who uh, has the intuition 
and has, they don't have to be the type A, mm -hmm. but a lot of times it is, you know, sometimes it's the older child. If you do studies on birth order, it's, <laughs> it's fascinating to find out how often it's the older child that, that is the type A, is the doer. Um, that's the person that oftentimes is the one that you want in place to be running. You know, they're not always super emotionally driven. Um, they're, they're business-like in their approach. Having this process uh, allows you to kind of filter that person out and figure out who's going to be the person that's properly uh, equipped. And then the other thing is regardless of who you have in your family, you're eliminating the guesswork. Mm -hmm. Guesswork is, I mean, that will just, that will, that will wreck you on the inside. Yeah. Um, having to figure out on your own what mom would have wanted or what dad would have wanted without clear direction. That's no place that you want to be in. Again, just talking about that fog of grief position mm -hmm. that can last you know, a, a long, a long period of time with no plan in place, your family's just guessing mm -hmm. about what you would want. And we want to eliminate that. And there are easy ways to do that. Just, just by sitting down and opening up about some things. Exactly. And I think, you know, another hard conversation to have, and in my line of work, I see it all the time is when it's a couple and one person has dementia and this happens more often than, you know, I like, obviously, but where, you know, maybe it was a husband, wife and husband's taking care of wife who has dementia, really covering up for her. Mm -hmm. No one knows how bad the situation is with mom. And then the caregiver who has all the stress on him because he's taking care of her and covering up, he passes away. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the family's dealing with, okay, we don't know what finances look like for dad. Oh, we had no idea. Mom has this much dementia. He covered it up. So when you're talking with families, do you kind of get into all of that and talk about power of attorney and all of that totally. stuff? We try to remind our clients that have gotten kids through college and maybe their kids are now married and have some kids of their own. Mm -hmm. We try to hearken them back to that time when they're at now adult children were in college and they would call and say, how are you doing? And every answer was the same. I'm going to class every single day. <laughs> I'm doing just fine. I'm studying hard. Right. And then mm -hmm. you get off the phone and maybe that's not exactly true what you're getting. Yeah. Well, in the world of elder care, it's, it happens in reverse. Mm -hmm. It's now it's the adult child who's calling mom and dad and saying, mm -hmm. how are you doing? And they're telling you everything's fine. We're doing just fine. When behind the scenes, maybe things aren't fine. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe adult child doesn't know that, you know, a week before their call, mom discovered that she couldn't make meals on her own and she's been eating, you know, cheese crackers for mm -hmm. the last week. Maybe you don't know that that dad has fallen or had an accident in his workshop mm -hmm. uh, because on the phone, everything's fine. And yeah. then you find out uh, either when it's, you know, you find out when it's too late or you find out when it's much more expensive than it had to be mm -hmm. that something really has to be done. So we do. We have the conversations with all of our estate planning clients about planning with a foot in two camps, with a foot in the the much more well-known um, area of planning for your eventual passing, right? Your death. How are you going to transfer ownership of what you have down the line to your spouse or to the next generation? Mm -hmm. But then the other camp is the disability camp. Who are you going to appoint as your legal decision makers if you reach a point where either it's inconvenient or it's impossible for you to make decisions for yourself because of an injury, because of an incapacitating you know, illness, because of Alzheimer's dementia, or just a general loss of independence as we all go through the natural parts of cognitive decline. Having planning covered on the death side and the disability side, it's like the Texas two-step. Yeah. You know, those are two steps to sound estate planning. And so we do have those conversations about mm -hmm. who are going to be those people and what power are they going to have to make those decisions for you either now or at some point in the future when, when your doctor says it's just not there anymore for mom or just not there anymore for dad. And, you know, when people are in denial, this is kind of brought up a question. If they've done no estate planning and they own a house and they have savings and stuff, what actually happens? I mean, I know that's got to be pretty ugly, you know, to figure all that oh, out. Absolutely. So if you're so being in denial mm -hmm. is a river I think we can cross. If we can just get people to the table and present them with kind of the reality that we all face as we get older, mm -hmm. um, you know, just statistically speaking, if you're talking about individuals over the age of 65, after 65, 
you have a 70% chance of needing some sort of nursing care during your life. And the average stay in a nursing home is two and a half years. If people can see that, and, and here's another thing, not to, not to digress, a lot of times mom and dad, they can't hear it the way they need to hear it from their own family members, much the way that uh, I don't hear things from my wife the same way that I might hear from my doctor. Mm-hmm. Hearing it from an outside professional, from an unbiased third party, can have a very helpful effect of opening a person's eyes to the reality of the situation and why they need to get this planning mm-hmm. in place. Um, so, yeah, we find that it's very helpful to have those conversations. Yeah. Um, the, the, the cost, though, moving, moving past denial mm-hmm. and into a, a position of incapacity, mm-hmm. the cost of having to, having to outfit a person with legal decision-making given to somebody else after their incapacity is so much greater. The cost is so much greater because now you're looking at your only other alternative, mm-hmm. which is normally a court-appointed guardianship. And, I mean, if you're comparing... If you're comparing the cost and the impact of power of attorney planning versus court appointed guardianship planning, it cannot be understated how vastly more expensive the cost of a court appointed guardianship to have a court appoint someone to basically become your parent all over again is not only costly up front, but it costs on an ongoing basis because of annual reporting requirements and things that have to be filed with the court inventory of your assets all of those things that that are really, really avoidable. So that's another huge incentive just to, to plan in advance. hundred percent. hundred percent. So how do you start the conversation for people who are sitting out here now going, okay, I need to find out what's going on with mom and dad. How do you um, start that conversation with them? Because a lot of times people will tell me, oh my gosh, my dad is so private. He won't tell us anything about their financial situation. Right. So timing is important. I make a joke about it, but Thanksgiving is right around the corner (laughs) and it's, you know, just get everybody together around the table so that Mm -hmm. everybody's in the same room and you only have to say it once, you know, ting, ting, ting on the glass (laughs) and just let them have it. Poor times are right in the middle of the emotional thick of a tragedy. Mm -hmm. That's probably not the best time to bring it up. So you need to be attentive to timing. You also have to be attentive to people's sensibilities. These are emotional topics and, and, we're all wired differently on an emotional level. Some of us are more capable of, I mentioned, you know, me and grandpa just driving around town mm-hmm. and, and I was thankfully in an emotional state where no, I didn't, it wasn't my favorite topic, but I was there and my ears were open. Uh, so I think being sensitive uh, to people's emotions, this is a conversation that a lot of times can catch people off guard. And so you need to be sensitive to if adult daughter has to get up and leave the room for a mm-hmm. second or if somebody needs tissues or a roll of toilet paper to make mm-hmm. it through. We don't let those things stop us, mm-hmm. but we can have these conversations in sensitive ways. And then I think also being inclusive of everybody in your family that that you would want to be a part of your decision making. They need to be there. Uh, again, I mentioned sort of jokingly, but sort of not. Big family gatherings give you the opportunity, one, to only say it once. And hopefully everybody hears it the same way so that there's no disagreement of opinion, especially in big families. A lot of times you can have different uh, personalities that think that they know what is best. Mm -hmm. Um, And having that conversation one time and having everybody on the same page uh, can be very can be very important. Would it be good, like, you know, say before Thanksgiving, if you kind of prep with your siblings and say, okay, we, we're going to all get on the same page. We're going to have this conversation. Let mom and dad know we really want to know your plans instead of, you know, springing it on them over the turkey and, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and then everyone kind of flipping out. But just kind of have that like conversation in advance is what we're going to do. We've got to talk about this and, mm-hmm. and get it in the open. I think having a game plan is important. If you are mom or dad, I think having a plan between the two of you and presenting it to your kids Mm -hmm. will go a long way. If you're the kids and you're thinking, you know, how are we going to open this door with mom or dad? I think having a game plan is important. I think discussing it amongst yourselves ahead of time is important. Mm -hmm. Divide and conquer is not always the worst Mm -hmm. way to prep 
right? Pull mom aside and say, hey, would, do you think it would be okay if we just brought this conversation up? Maybe not get into the details until mom and dad are, are together, mm -hmm. but at least warming people up to the idea. I think, I think there's value there. Mm -hmm. I uh, would agree. Because yeah. you, what you don't want is you don't want to try to open that door and then have people shut down. Mm -hmm. And then it, who knows, it could be another year before that opportunity is there. So just being sensitive to those things, but also helping your loved ones understand we're the ones that are going to be left to clean these messes up if they're not addressed now. Yeah. And it sounds, um, it sounds a little cliche, but it's totally true. If you love us, you will share with us this information so that, so that our grief process is somehow lessened by the ability to get the business of this work done. I absolutely agree. Do you find it's more the, the older parents that don't want to share or is it the, you know, the younger people, the kids, or is it kind of a little bit of both? Me personally, I think people from older generations, I do think that there is a subculture of privacy there that sometimes mm -hmm. has, has to be navigated, not in all circumstances. Death and money is what is yeah. what we're mixing here. And so those are difficult things to talk about. Here's another thing. Sometimes the parents don't know exactly what they want done. That's a whole other angle that needs to be considered is have this talk. Husband and wife have this, have this talk among yourself before, you know, mm -hmm. before you go off. I find that people of an older generation, generally there's a privacy obstacle that needs to, to be gotten over uh, in some circumstances. Um, for the younger kids, I think it's more the emotional thing because they're having to, they're having to struggle with two things. One is the possibility of, of mom or dad's ultimate passing. Mm -hmm. And then are they, this is, for me personally, are they ready to step into life without mom or dad as their advice giver, as their counselor, as their guide? Um, that can be a scary thing. And yeah. avoidance sometimes, you know, the old saying that ignorance is bliss. Sometimes just choosing to remain ignorant of that fact can help people cope. Mm -hmm. It does not help when that eventuality mm -hmm. ultimately comes. So maybe it helps them in the short term. You don't want to think about mom dying. You can't go there. But in the long term, you know, if she passes suddenly or is incapacitated and now you don't know what she needs. So, I mean, I think it's better to know. Yeah, absolutely. So, Communicate and over communicate. Yeah, I agree. Even though, you know, it's not, no one wants to think about their parents dying, but I mean, it is part of life. We're all going to die at sure, some point. Sure. So. And really at the end of the day, I counsel clients on this. This is a business meeting, mm -hmm. just like any other business meeting. You've spent your life accumulating some level of wealth, whether it's modest or vast. Mm -hmm. And the time has come to talk about how we are going to succeed that wealth on to the next generation. So, while, yes, the catalyst for that is death, at the end of the day, the meeting itself is, is a business meeting about transitioning the finances. Mm -hmm. And so the greater we can at least put our emotions on the shelf for the moment, it doesn't make you an insensitive person. It doesn't make you cold. It, mm -hmm. it, it actually, in a way, makes you more caring because you're willing to not let those emotions overcome you to the extent that you're avoiding addressing these matters mm -hmm. that your family needs to know about. I mean, I, to me, it feels like it's really a gift that you're giving your children because, you know, as a, as a mom myself, I don't want my kids struggling with already the emotional aspect of, you know, me passing, but I want them to, I don't want them to have to figure out finances and figure out what was going on and have to go, you know, lose some of that money and end up being an expensive yep. issue for them. So what, um, I know we've hit a lot of these on, you know, keeping the conversation open and are there any other roadblocks to avoid along the way? So I would say isolation is a major one. Mm -hmm. I mentioned that just having the conversation as a business meeting, there is, uh, there are industry professionals. You and I are both of, you know, in, mm -hmm. in this industry, there are industry professionals that have the training to help family members get through this process. And so no one should have to go through this alone mm -hmm. because I mentioned it earlier. You don't know what you don't know. As an attorney, you know, I think sometimes it's easy for me to kind of get caught up in my head about does a couple need a spousal lifetime access trust or some highly <laughs> sophisticated level of planning. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people just need directions to the courthouse. Mm -hmm. And one of the commitments that we've made in our practice is not only to serve the clients that come to us 
but to make sure that we develop a close enough relationship where they can tell their their kids or their other family members that we're someone that they can call. It's very surprising to me how few people have a relationship with a professional advisor, whether it's an attorney or a CPA or whatever, but particularly attorneys. I don't know if there's an intimidation factor about dealing with an attorney that you don't know. We're constantly striving to break that barrier down Mm -hmm. for this exact reason. We don't want people having to go through this process by themselves without the guidance from a professional. Mm -hmm. And so if we can break that barrier down for their parents or for their other loved ones and open that door, you know, I've advised clients before about just that hypothetical Thanksgiving meeting, Mm -hmm. invite your attorney, let them come come on over, (laughs) you know, just to be a part of that process. I've Mm -hmm. had clients that have come to sign their documents and they've brought their kids in. And and more often than not, it's their adult children Mm -hmm. that are going to be a part of the process. But I had a couple back in the summer that brought their high school student in with them that was getting ready to go to college because Mm -hmm. they wanted those kids to see the process Mm -hmm. and to start thinking about it early. I thought just to your point about it being a gift, it really is. is. It's a gift of wisdom Mm -hmm. and what you're giving. And that's a huge, huge value that you can give to your kids. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think this has been great information and I know it's a topic you know, like I said, a lot of people don't want to talk about the con- having the conversation, but I think these are wonderful tips and I appreciate you being on the show so much. We're going to have your contact information so people can reach out to you and, um, and have those schedule time to talk to you and schedule those conversations as well. That's great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you so much for being on and thanks for being, um, for people for listening and tune in next time. Thanks for being on. Bye-bye.